Welcome to your second of what will likely be four fully vodcasted lectures this semester. If you're watching this during the regularly scheduled lecture time, then it is Friday, October the 5th. And I'm going to keep my announcements to a minimum because I know that the thing that is most likely on your mind is the second exam. That exam will be on the 9th of October, which is next Tuesday. And of course, as always, I will run review sessions on the 8th, one from 3 to 4 p.m. We'll stay right here in the classroom if that's available to us. If not, we'll go upstairs to the lab. And then, of course, I'll be online as always from 7.30 to 8.30 p.m. on Illuminate. So if you want to review during that time as well, you can. I will try to post a vodcast of the 3 to 4 p.m. lecture so that you can, the review, so that you can go back to that at another time if you would like to. In lab, I'm just going to ha go ahead and look ahead a little bit, and this is not for a while, but on October 16th, you'll be having your first practical exam. So on that note, I think we should jump right in because we were in the depths of metabolism when we left off and we were getting pretty stoked. And I hope that some of you have already sat down and begun to make your poster on your pillowcase or on your bedsheet or on your t-shirt or whatever it is that is working for you to make a great metabolism poster. We had been talking when we left off last time about the glucose grading pathways that are the most famous. Those are glycolysis, also known as the Ebden-Meyerhoff pathway, as well as the pentose phosphate pathway. Today, I want to begin our coverage with a third pathway because not all bacteria utilize the Ebden-Meyerhoff or the pentose phosphate pathway. And in fact, some of them actually meld the two in a pathway that's called the Etner-Duderoff pathway. This pathway was once thought to be unique to only soil microorganisms, those such as Pseudomonas, Rhizobium, Azotobacter, and Agrobacterium, very famous bacteria, not to dismiss them in any way. But of course, there, um, there have been more and more bacteria. We're seeing a rise in the number of microorganisms that do display a functional etner duderoff pathway. So this pathway is maybe more, more a little bit more prevalent in uh, bacteria than perhaps we once thought it was. The way that this pathway works, though, is a little bit like glycolysis in that all of the trio stages of the adner duderoff pathway are the same. Only one, there's only one three-carbon molecule that passes through those stages. And then the hexostages, those are much more like the pentose phosphate pathway, the oxidative stages of the pentose phosphate pathway when we saw the production of NADPH. So we might say that the etner duderoff pathway actually marries both of these pathways, glycolysis and the pentose phosphate pathway. And what that means is that it allows soil bacteria that are running this pathway, like Pseudomonas, to produce a little bit of everything, a smorgasbord, so to speak. They can produce some NADPH, but also at the same time, they can produce NADH and ATP. So they're getting a little bit of everything by running this unique pathway. I want to look at the pathway, and while I don't want you guys to memorize this pathway, I want you to think a little bit about it, and I want you to particularly think about the yield of the pathway. And it would be a great thing maybe to add to the side on your poster so that you know that not all bacteria are running glycolysis in the pentose phosphate pathway. Here's a good look at the first stages where notice that glucose again becomes glucose 6-phosphate consuming 1-ATP. That's no strange reaction to us. That is exactly the same as the first step of glycolysis. We've certainly seen it before. But the next steps are very much like what we saw in the pentose phosphate pathway. And in fact, we see the yield immediately of NADPH. So we know that NADPH can run off and give its reducing equivalents to biosynthetic pathways. So this is the first product of the pathway fairly early on. But then this 6 phosphogluconate is going to go on in the next stage to form um, another product in which can be converted into one molecule of pyruvate. So notice that right away in this pathway we get one 3 carbon product yielded. That means that only one 3 carbon molecule, only one glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate, goes through the recognizable trio stages of glycolysis. So these next stages you're going to recognize quite readily as being those that we saw in the last phase of glycolysis in the trio stages or the three carbon stages of that particular pathway. So notice as glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate is oxidized just as it was in glycolysis, this gives off the pay dirt of NADH. So one molecule of NADH is formed. In the next step, one molecule of ATP.
the substrate level phosphorylation that we talked about in this, the um, equivalent step in glycolysis. Now, running through these same steps that we still recognize, remember that when phosphoenopyruvate is, is converted into pyruvate, we get yet the last production of ATP. So recognize that ATP was consumed in the first step of this pathway, so we were one in the hole by the time we got to the trio stages. So here we come out of the hole, netting zero, but by the last step, there's a net of one ATP. So let's summarize what's net in the Entner-Deuterov pathway, because it's definitely different than what was net in glycolysis. First off, we see that production of NADPH, and that's unique. But then we see one NADH, and we see one ATP made in this pathway. So that's going to be a part of the net yield, or that's giving the net yield for the Etner-Deuterov pathway. We can compare that to glycolysis. Well, it's more NADPH, because glycolysis didn't make any NADPH. But it's less ATP and less NADH. In fact, it's half the amount. So our, our, our equivalent yield here, we see that one to one to one, right? One of everything. But we see more of the NADPH and less ATP and less NADH. So this gives us an idea that other kinds of pathways, glucose degrading pathways, exist. Now, they may not be pertinent in the yeast cell whose big picture view we were drawing when we last left off. And that's actually where I want to return now, but please don't dismiss the etner deuterov pathway and maybe add it onto your poster just to the side or outside of your yeast cell if that's the system that you're drawing your poster in. For me, that is the system that I've been drawing my poster, so I'm going to bring up that that ever-evolving poster that I'm making and show you that we can look at what's going to happen next in, this, in all of this big picture view. So we have glycolysis sort of jotted down here. We could also note to ourselves that the pentose phosphate pathway could also be occurring in this yeast cell. So we could see the hexose monophosphate shunt, so to speak, where this glucose phosphate path or glucose 6-phosphate molecule could enter into the pentose phosphate pathway. I'll just abbreviate it as PPP. Recognizing that that path pathway gives off two things. It gives off NADPH to be used in as reducing power in biosyntheses. We also know that it gives off ribose 5-phosphate. And then, of course, the molecules that come off of that can get shunted back into the glycolytic pathway. And this can be a big part of the gl glucose degradation in any given cell, depending upon the needs of the cell, right? Is the cell focused on biosynthesis? will then run a lot of the pentose phosphate pathway. Or is it instead focused in on generating a lot of ATP and a lot of NADH? Well, then glycolysis would be the preferred pathway. But regardless of how you look at glucose degradation in the cytosol, we recall that we ended up with two pyruvate molecules being the product. And today, that's where I want to talk a lot, is about these two pyruvate molecules that have, they sort of represent a point where there can be many paths taken. That is, we could say that there is a fork in the road. In fact, it's more than a fork because there are three possible fates of pyruvate that we're going to discuss at this point. Now, maybe a cell, a yeast cell, maybe it needs to make more reducing power and more ATP. In which case, it's actually going to transport the pyruvate into the mitochondrial matrix of the cell, where it's going to further oxidize it. Now, if we were in a bacterial cell, of course, we know that further oxidation would just continue to happen in the cytosol, because there is no mitochondrion. So we could see further oxidation being the first possible fate, I'll number this number one, of pyruvate, and in further oxidation, we know that more electrons are going to get ripped and stripped off of this molecule. Sorry, that's a T. <laughs> so in further oxidation, we'll get more and more electrons ripped and stripped off of this uh, pyruvate molecule, creating uh, eventually acetyl-CoA. We'll go into the details of that momentarily. And that acetyl-CoA can pass into the TCA. And in the TCA, it can get further oxidized, right? We've got um, many steps within that TCA cycle as more and more electrons are ripped and stripped. One, two, three. So from there, 
Um, we know that a lot of NADH is generated, a lot of FADH2 is generated, a lot of reducing power, a lot of ATP, but we know that that requires the presence of an electron transport chain and the pumping of protons into the inner membrane space here and the use of those protons to make ATP, the, our favorite word, oxfos. So we recognize that all of this is contingent upon the presence of an electron transport chain and a terminal acceptor for an electron transport chain. If none of that is around, that is to say, what if a yeast cell doesn't have any oxygen? No terminal electron acceptor for its electron transport chain. That means that all of this is mute. No, no terminal electron acceptor for the electron transport chain means the ETC doesn't go, means the TCA doesn't go, means the transition step doesn't go, means further oxidation does not happen. So it means fate number one does not occur. So that's a good thing in that we know there are other possible fates for pyruvate. And in fact, the next one I want to look at is actually one that I'll number fate number three. Because if there is no ETC, there is no TCA, no further oxidation, then that means that the yeast cell has to make everything very localized in the cytosol. And if there's no place for this cytosolic NADH to go because there is no functional electron transport chain, then there has to be some way for this NADH to get re, re, uh, to get reoxidized and reconverted back to NAD plus to keep the glycolytic pathway going. Because let's face it, if step number six stopped, then the whole thing would stop. So there has to be a way for that NADH to get converted back to NAD plus. And that's fate number three of pyruvate. That is, pyruvate can be, an, um, or a derivative of pyruvate, can be used as a terminal electron acceptor that is internally derived. That is to say, fermentation, baby, right? This, this pyruvate can get converted into acetaldehyde. And this acetaldehyde can get converted into ethanol. This allows for the regeneration of NAD+, because NADH can drop its electrons off on acetaldehyde, reducing it to ethanol. And we get the production of ethanol, and the yeast gets to keep on making uh, pyruvate through glycolysis, keep on netting ATP through glycolysis. So this fate number three is actually the first one that we're going to go into great depth on. However, notice that I've left out fate number two. Depending upon the needs of a cell, it might be that pyruvate is, you guessed it, used as a precursor metabolite. That is, it's used to build larger molecules. So pyruvate can also be a precursor metabolite. So now we've seen this fork in the road, it's actually a triple branch in the road, where we can get fate one, two, or three of pyruvate. And in fact, sometimes some pyruvates might go one way and others another way. But do suffice it to say that if the electron transport chain is absent, doesn't have an externally derived acceptor, isn't running, well then further oxidation is not going to be the fate. Let's go ahead and jot down these three possible fates of pyruvate. First, further oxidation. We saw that happening in a yeast cell in the mitochondrial matrix. Second, Precursor metabolite can be used in an anabolic pathway as a building block. Third, electron acceptor and fermentation. That is, it can be utilized, or a derivative of pyruvate can be utilized to take on the electrons that are made from the, on the NADH that's made in glycolysis and allow glycolysis to keep on pumping out ATP. So this is the fate that I want to go into depth on. And to begin with, let's talk about the kind of fermentation that takes place in a yeast cell. There are also some other kinds of microbial life that can utilize alcoholic fermentation. So in alcoholic fermentation, remember here we have the short down and dirty version of glycolysis where we recognize that 2-ATP were net and 2-NADH is, and that the two products, there, the product there are two pyruvate molecules. And in order to get alcoholic fermentation, those two pyruvate molecules are converted into acetaldehyde. But notice that this requires a decarboxylation. So recognize that as pyruvates are converted to acetaldehyde, it gives off a thoroughly worn out, totally used up CO2. So this is going to become really poignant when we decide to make our 
our alcohol in lab. We're going to be making wine starting in lab 18. And what you guys will notice is that your cultures will bubble profusely when you're making your wine. And that is the production of carbon dioxide as pyruvate is converted to acetaldehyde. Now that acetaldehyde is the hero of the day because it's what's able to take on the electrons from NADH that was made in glycolysis and allow that NADH to be reconverted to NAD+. That's what keeps glycolysis running. If that didn't happen, glycolysis would stop. So this conversion of acetaldehyde to ethanol is what allows the pathway to keep on going. So for the yeast, what they get out of this is actually the regeneration of their NAD+, and the ability to keep glycolysis moving. But some of you are looking at this and you're saying, you know, Rachel, not everything performs alcoholic fermentation, right? We don't. So, Jacob, you might be thinking to yourself, you know, when I'm out running 400s on the track, I'm certainly not producing ethanol as a byproduct of my fermentation. I know I'm getting lactic acid -y, right? Get a lot of production of lactic acid as a result of fermentation. So, not all organisms use alcoholic fermentation, and in fact, many of them use lactic acid fermentation. One of our poster groups, the Bodies of Bacteria poster group, great name by the way, um, Claire and Anna have been heading up that group, and they're doing a lot of work looking at the human microbiome, meaning the normal flora bacteria that, for example, line our gut. These bacteria are frequently, and many of them, are lactic acid bacteria, very important constituents of our normal flora. So these lactic acid bacteria, like us, use lactic acid fermentation. And in fact, get this, lactic acid bacteria or the lab, they don't even have, most of them, they don't even have an electron transport chain. So that means they rely solely on lactic acid fermentation to generate their energy. Now, lactic acid fermentation is a little different than alcoholic fermentation because rather than pyruvate getting converted into acetaldehyde first, it's actually converted straight to lactic acid. That is, there is no intermediary step. The pyruvate itself is going to be the hero of the day, taking on those NADHs that were made in step 6 of glycolysis and allowing for the regeneration of NAD+. So the product of this reduction of pyruvate is lactate. It's going to be the product of lactic acid fermentation. So we recognize that lactic acid bacteria and humans, we use lactic acid fermentation when needed. So it turns out that not all bacteria are this straightforward in their fermentation. In fact, there are things that are what we call heterolactic fermenters, meaning that lactate, lactic acid fermentation is only one of the types of fermentation that they use. Some use only lactic acid fermentation, we call those homolactic fermenters, versus those that might produce both ethanol. Maybe they do some alcoholic fermentation and some lactic acid fermentation, and they have the whole nine yards, right? And those are heterolactic fermenters. So multiple types of fermentation, and in fact, I should further note that lactic acid fermentation and alcoholic fermentation are only two types of a diverse world of fermentation. In lab, we're going to look at something called mixed acid fermentation. We're going to also look at something called 2,3-butendiol fermentation, where that's another product of fermentation. Those of you like me who occasionally madly crave Swiss cheese, I don't know, it's so random. Sometimes I madly crave Swiss cheese in the middle of the night, it's just odd. Um, but in any case, that's propionic fermentation. Propionic acid is a byproduct of that kind of fermentation. So there's a lot of different kinds of fermenters, but the long of the short of it is that for the organism, it's, you know, right, it's tempting to think that the purpose of fermentation is to make booze, is to make cheese, right? <laughs> you know, what's wine without cheese? Um, so it's tempting to think that, but in fact, that is not the purpose of fermentation. The purpose of fermentation is to regenerate NAD+, to allow glycolysis to keep on running, to keep on moving. That's the purpose of fermentation. This allows the, the continual generation of ATP even when there is no functional ETC or the terminal electron acceptor for the ETC is not around. Now, we've been pretty egocentric about what that terminal electron acceptor is. 
We've talked a lot about those organisms that use oxygen as their terminal electron acceptor. But in fact, there are many types of bacteria that do not use oxygen as their terminal electron acceptor. So let's broaden our view a bit and say that fermentation is something that has to occur in the absence of an externally derived electron acceptor. That is something like oxygen that comes from the environment. But some bacteria use something besides oxygen as their terminal electron acceptor. Some of them can even use molecules like CO2 as their terminal electron acceptor or sulfur. So we can get a lot of diverse types of molecules taken from the environment, externally derived, and used as that final electron member, electron carrying member in our electron relay team. So fermentation, I hope that helps to summarize and talk about the purpose of fermentation.